Okay, good morning. Uh, this is Brian Harrington. I'm going to be presenting a simulation for balancing mixed model assembly lines. And um, we'll go ahead and get started. So a little bit about myself. Um, I've worked at Ford Motor Company for 20 years as a simulation expert in a Six Sigma black belt. So I've done uh, a lot of projects around our body, paint, and final operations uh, within the vehicle operations. Uh, designing new systems, um, creating more capability and capacity, um, introducing flexible and lean manufacturing systems uh, into our uh, plants. Um, I'm now on my fourth year running my own uh, uh, LLC, a uh, simulation-based company, um, consulting company called uh, Mountain Sim. So uh, currently I um, reside in Whitefish, Montana, which will be uh, the next slide here. So a little bit about uh, this is where we picked up the name uh, Mountain Sim. Um, live in the uh, beautiful area of Whitefish, Montana, as you can see. In a month's time, um, it's going to soon look like this. We're already starting to get quite a bit of snow accumulation uh, in the mountains. So a little bit uh, about uh, where Mountain Sim uh, resides. So with that, I'm getting back to the topic at hand, uh, looking at uh, flexible manufacturing and mixed model assembly. So uh, the slides that I'm going to take you through are um, how simulation can support flexible manufacturing and mixed model assemblies. So the, the topics that we'll look at, why do we do mixed model assembly? Um, some early planning decisions um, that are made when we're going to be uh, looking at bringing in new tools or flexible routing or flexible uh, machines. Um, and so we're going to be uh, definitely putting the emphasis on how we apply simulation analysis to implement and get these flexible tools into our uh, system. So we'll actually look at some uh, simulation um, aspects that bring product engineers and manufacturing engineers um, even early on uh, in the uh, uh, design phase. So designing products in a manufacturing context. And then the, the core of this presentation will be around discrete event, how discrete event simulation can support and lead this effort. And so we'll look at early on uh, developing cells and station level uh, models that have to do with at the task level and looking at what the tack times for a particular flexible station would be. We'll then step into two areas that are very common when we talk about mixed model assemblies. Uh, the flexibility that resides actually within machines and then also the flexibility that uh, resides within routing variations. Um, and then one of the uh, largest pieces really of, of uh, when we talk about mixed model assemblies is uh, exploring different scheduling schemes. Um, you know, are there going to be, in a sense, uh, historically we often did batch builds and things like that where now we'll be doing uh, a little bit more complex scheduling schemes where we're sending out maybe a blend of vehicles um, that match closely to the product mix or trying to adhere to the customer order base as closely as possible. So along this journey there'll be quite a few conflicting objectives that uh, arise and we'll see how we can minimize uh, the, uh, the effects of complexity when we look at these uh, conflicting objectives. And then finally we'll take a look at some of the simulation results and how I ultimately reduce costs and the associated risks of uh, implementing uh, flexible manufacturing. So this is, a, this is just a, a, a quote from a recent Ford Motor Company online article that they had published. And so this is definitely coming up uh, next year. Uh, Ford will, def will have, uh, on average, four vehicle uh, types or different products uh, within each one of their uh, automotive uh, manufacturing facilities. So what we see here um, that has been taking place in, in most of our uh, large automotive uh, companies is a reduction in the number of plants or assembly facilities and an increase in the amount of vehicles that they're producing. So we know that uh, 
automotive industry and a lot of manufacturing industries are, are um, heavily asset uh, cost, high asset cost driven uh, plants. In other words, they have a lot of advanced uh, tooling and assets that cost uh, that, that have large uh, budgets associated with them. So the robotics and the laser welding and so by uh, with the initiative of reducing uh, the number of plants, increasing the flexibility within these plants, obviously it's a, uh, a cost saving uh, effort um, that, uh, that the automotive industry has definitely um, picked up on. So the notion of a dedicated plant to build one vehicle is in the past. So now a plant will be have the capability to, pr to produce uh, a family of vehicles. So what, when we look at mixed model assembly, how does it? Uh, the what are the, the the drivers that are are pushing us towards mixed uh, model assembly? Um, a shorter development time. So to, to launch a vehicle program, to get it to market, um, we're looking at shorter development times. We're ultimately trying to get beat our competition to the marketplace, get our new vehicle out there. We're trying to keep our customers satisfied, um, build to their customer order base, um, get their product when, uh, in, a, in a, a reasonable amount of time after they place an order. An order. So obviously flexible to customer demands. Um, in the summertime, there might be more demands for convertibles and vehicles with uh, roof, sun rooftops and so on, or moon roofs. So obviously a family of products is key um, to delivering these uh, to meet the customer um, expectations. And, and uh, of utmost important, delivering a quality um, product. So why do we, why simulation? So with, with these uh, factors that are driving the need for flexible manufacturing and mixed model assemblies, the uh, leaner production environment for sure. Um, we have uh, engineers have a, a shorter amount of time to get the vehicle to, to implementation to uh, launch that program. So uh, product engineers and manufacturing engineers need to work closely to uh, be able to uh, reduce the risks um, when and when bringing several products into a plant, and uh, it's going to obviously increase the complexity. Yet we have a shorter uh, development development period uh, to work on this, and uh, um, the narrow profit margins um, that exist uh, higher competition. So when we have one design and one process and multiple products, once we get that flexible machine or flexible manufacturing facility up and running, this is going to be a win-win for the customer and for the company uh, delivering uh, the, fu the flexible uh, products. So. Uh, this is just an example of a discrete event simulation model that shows the, the full scope of a large facility. This is, a, this is a body shop, so I'll spend a little bit of time here and then we'll, we'll backtrack on some of the uh, concepts that are um, baked into this model. So you can see this is a relatively large scope of, um, again, of a body shop. And the, uh, a large portion of this is actually a palletized system. So when we look at these, the, the different colored boxes, those represent lines. So it, it'll start out where, where we're working on the underbody of a vehicle and it'll go through uh, the system sequentially and it'll hit a few parallel lines. Um, and then ultimately it'll go through where it receives some closures like the doors and the trunk lid and then there's a repair spur and then finally out to where it's going to get shipped out to uh, the, the, the next facility which paints the vehicle. So in automotive we have a body shop that feeds the paint shop, then the paint shop usually feeds uh, the final assembly operations. And each one of these could be a unique model. In this particular model we're, we're running, we're going to run three different product types through here. So this is a model that would have the, the three different products. And that could be captured in a uh, probability profile or a distribution that captures that product mix. So we can see that we can send a variety of products down 
the assembly line. Um, when we do so, uh, if we just look at the sequence, when this sequence A, when they start out, this could be uh, representative of the customer order. So sending them out according to how their uh, customer orders the vehicles. And as they flow through this palletized system, you know, there's buffers and decouplers in, in route. There's broadcast points that actually send a signal to say, go ahead and build this subassembly. That subassembly is going to travel down a power and free system and then get delivered to a certain rendezvous point where that particular uh, door or body side must meet up with the, the, the uh, matching, with its matching uh, vehicle. So that's all tracked in the, in the model as well. But you can see this sequence A, as it travels through a sequential system, um, if it goes into a, the weld inspection um, place, it might get out of order. Um, so, and then for sure when it goes through uh, this, where there's a parallel line, um, it could actually establish a new sequence. So it could get scrambled up a little bit. Some of the vehicles might be a little bit detained or late or arrive early at this point. So this is a new sequence, sequence B. And then as the vehicles travel, go down this cross transfer, head through the closures line. Um, there's another area where some of them might um, go through a little repair spur, um, get some burrs, uh, well, you know, welding burrs, sand it off, or what, whatever it might be in the body operations. And then the vehicle will travel on. You can see through this, there would be another sequence, sequence C. So you can see just through traveling through this system here, the, we're trying to obtain and keep the, the vehicles according to the customer order. Um, but you can see there's quite a few different opportunities where the, the sequence can get out of the original order base. This can cause issues, when, particularly when we're looking at uh, broadcast signals of signaling a sub-assembly to be built because that subassembly is going to match that particular vehicle type or that product type. So this is where complexities arise, um, particular with uh, sequencing and trying to um, keep our subcomponents that are being delivered from either a marketplace or getting built up to assure that that rendezvous is going to occur. So simulation, we're going to see that can definitely help out in, in securing and uh, placing uh, broadcast points and signaling, uh, sequencing signals um, at the most re robust place um, within the facility. Okay, so um, one of the decisions early on is if we were, in this example, looking at a company that had six assembly plants and they're interested in, in building 20 vehicle types, uh, what decisions do they early on in the in the system say? Where do we put this? And what particular plant are we going to place this new pickup truck? And so uh, some of the rule of thumbs are: um, you definitely want to put place it in a facility with a similar product type. It's similar the better, the closer they they are. But that's not to be said that we we don't have vehicles where they're relatively like a. A uh, large SUV and a, and a uh, smaller midsize, it can be done. But generally, a rule of thumb, we want a similar product type um, built on the same platform, um, something that can leverage some of the dimensional control points that exist that add cost to the um, facility. We also um, want the build times to be, again, rule of thumb, within 30% of the existing product builds. So you don't want uh, something that's going to take twice as long to build as the next uh, vehicle type. Uh, so looking at the, so there, the technology that's within the facility, is it going to be uh, capable of delivering and meeting the cycle times um, within the, uh, the, built, the unique build types per vehicle? Um, and then lastly, we have to look at the plant. Is, does it have the capability and the capacity some of these plants, uh, when we looked at that slide, were, were, were minimizing the uh, manufacturing facilities and increasing the uh, number of vehicles. A lot of these plants are working uh, three shifts. You know, they're working around the clock, 24-7, so that uh, we need to make sure that, you know, does this plant have even the schedule or, or the shift um, to the, the required shift time to produce the, the new vehicle. 
Um, and also, does is there market demand enough market demand to warrant placing it in this uh, facility? So build schedule um, obviously becomes a uh, factor. So some of the engineer some of the simulation engineering that even um, that starts even prior to when we implement discrete event simulation is this notion of Early on in, pro in the program timing, we want our design engineers to be working with our manufacturing engineers when they're designing new vehicles and new products. Let's say, for example, if I was an engineer that was designing a, uh, a new fender uh, for a particular vehicle, um, we can use some software, some simulation software, where I can actually design that fender within a, uh, a, a manufacturing context. So designing in a manufacturing context is I could bring, if I was working on that fender, let's say in Katia, I could bring that 3D model into, into a manufacturing uh, setting. And from um, within that setting, I can look and see, do these weld spot pattern layouts um, actually work? Are the dimensional hard point control points um, in, a, in a, a place where the, the, that I don't have to modify them or do a changeover or tool setup? So, um, and you, you obviously want to have the engineer, the design engineer, have the freedom to design his unique uh, new fender. But if he can do it, or he or she do it in the context of using the exist, existing tooling and uh, tooling we're going to obviously um, save on uh, tool costs. And, and, um, and this is where our flexible tooling come into place. So the bill process, so when a, a design engineer usually is set up, there's a bill of process where, these, where, it's going to, where he knows, he or she knows that this fender is referenced at these particular points according to the bill of process. And then they can look up in this, in this uh, um, the example that I'm, I'm referring to is uh, uh, like Siemens Team Center uh, Engineering, uh, where we actually have some of the manufacturing um, simulations that could be conducted in RoboCAD, um, and we have a 3D manufacturing uh, model set up. And so the, the engineer will know exactly where in the process this is referenced, and then they can look and put their part into it the next slide will actually look at that. So this is what uh, design and manufacturing context is all about. Design engineers building this, in this case, it's a door. And they can search the bill of process, find out where that door is referenced, go to that. At, that, at this process node, there could be some information of a simulation attached to it at this particular point. And then they could actually bring this door into this model and see if they're not these robots are going to articulate to uh, do the weld spot pattern layout. Um, do this, does the dimensional control information work? So early on designs um, that, uh, that we can have uh, between our product engineers and our manufacturing engineers is going to be key into assuring that some of our flexible tooling still work with the new design to come. So, this is uh, shifting gears. Now we're going to just um, see how discrete event simulation, applying discrete event simulation, when we do have process changes, when we're looking at uh, um, implementing line balancing, when we're adding flexible tools into the system, when we're allowing flexible routing, and then uh, talking about some of the scheduling schemes that uh, exist. So from, from the remaining point or uh, topics, will be with respect to discrete event simulation. So this is uh, a deterministic calculation that happens um, that engineers use often uh, when, when trying to uh, figure out what or calculate what the uh, cycle time for a particular station is going to be. So a lot of us have used um, uh, precedence, precedence diagrams. I'm not going to go through in great deal um, how we do uh, uh, press programs and all the nuts and bolts that exist in it, but I want to get the point across that this is a, a common deterministic calculation and how we can take it 
um, above and beyond what this can do when we put it into sim the simulation world. So in this example, it's a simple example of we're trying to um, come up with uh, the number of stations and the cycle times, do a little bit of conducting a little bit of line balancing on this. So in this example, we, we're, we're trying to produce 500 units per day within an eight-hour shift. And so to calculate the tack time, that's just the, the, the cycle time that a particular station would need to work at, it's simply just the, um, the, the, the uh, working time divided by the number of units. We come up with uh, 57.6 seconds. And what we know is this, is this would be similar to the bill of process, these assigned tasks. We know that there's A, B, C, all the way through L. These are the tasks or the, pro the, the steps that we take in order to assemble this vehicle. When we look or this product, and when we look at a particular, when we see three of them in a row like this, this just means that they can be conducted um, simultaneously. So they can be all done at the same time. When we say that A is before B, this step needs to be completed. A needs to be completed before B gets completed, and so on. Simultaneous tasks. And so we know when we start, we just know what the tasks are. Now we want to group these tasks. So a precedence diagram simply says that uh, in this case, we've grouped these three that are color-coded in red, then we grouped these two, and then we grouped these three here, and these are the groupings that's, that we see in this. So that this one grouping of ABC, that represents the tasks within station one, and it has an overall cycle time less than 57.6 seconds. It's coming in at 55. And then uh, the second station, we have these two tasks that actually add up to 57 seconds, and so on. So, again, a deterministic calculation that is often used. But we can go above and beyond that when we put that into uh, the simulation uh, world. We can actually easily conduct wet if analysis. And this is the grouping that we just went over. And ultimately, um, these three tasks, they might, when we take them into a, a full-scale simulation model, just be somewhat black box into a into just the station, the one station that, that runs at 55 seconds. Again, this, this, second, station, this second station that has two subtasks or sub or, um, tasks or process uh, involved might be just uh, one station right here. So we see the five stations, they represent, uh, they're represented just at the station level within the model. But and they all have the associated uh, cycle times with them. So you can see that we can easily um, create a model um, that, that captures the, the, ex, the exact same deterministic behavior that we could do when we do a precedence diagram. But more importantly, we can now, if it, if it gets a little bit more complicated, you can see that these deterministic calculations start to peter out. Let's say we get more detail on it, and task one does require an operator, or task A. And task C requires an operator, um, and they might be screwing on a bolt or doing, you know, some type of uh, applying a um, adhesive um, E. So each one of these that has the annotation of an operator, it, it uh, requires that additional labor. So the the uh, some of the questions that might management might ask is, well, can we have a shared resource uh, handle that? Can they do? You know, this is just a portion of the 15 seconds. He's only required to be there maybe three seconds, whatever it might be. So we can see that by when we start to put some of the real life complexity that exists within these uh, precedence diagrams, they can become a little bit more complicated. So in this case, we can go ahead and, and set it in motion, the simulation. We can see our shared resource. Uh, going between the two different um, stations, we have three operators, and there, and we also can run a, a product mix through it. So we can see that some of the vehicles, you know, they're color coded. We have uh, different vehicle types. Each one of these could actually have a unique cycle time um, associated with those. So the complexity goes above and beyond what we can usually handle in a deterministic uh, calculation of um, just implementing a precedence diagram. Um, some of this real life or stochastic behavior that we can put into these models 
that really take it beyond what we could normally do with just when we're doing uh, precedent diagrams. We can we can add over cycles to it. So um, the cycle times uh, might come in at a at a particular station at 15 seconds, but it might have an over cycle condition. It doesn't happen often, but it may be five second over cycle. It can take it all the way up to 20 seconds. So we can put in skewed distributions um, for cycle times. Uh, we can place in mean time between failures and mean time to repair. So that's our, our downtime factors. Um, they can be placed on every uh, task or at the station level. Um, an exponential distribution is a known distribution that works well for mean time between failures. An Erling distribution can, um, again, a known distribution that works well for capturing the behavior of downtime occurrences. Or, I mean, how long it's going to take to repair. Um, so an Erlang distribution. And then um, even our changeovers and tool setups. They, um, so every time a different vehicle type uh, travels through a, an asset, it might uh, require a uh, tool setup or a, a changeover. They can be placed in there as well. And then, of course, just the uh, notion of running the uh, uh, product mix through these. Um, we can run different uh, what-if scenarios on adjusting our product mix. Um, sending them out in a, in a blend, or sending them out in a random fashion, or sending them out in small batch sizes. All these can be uh, run through our simulation analysis. So next we'll talk about some of the, the two common factors that come up when we're implementing uh, mixed model variants. Um, often it's the uh, machine flexibility that exists in the facility and the routing flexibility. So we can take a quick comparison of these two, um, looking at some of the ways that techniques, the most common techniques that we use when we're putting uh, flexible tools or routing variations into a facility. So in this, um, this is an example. If we were looking at a facility that just had, it had a well, let's just say it has a well table. And again, we have the four different product types that are flowing through the, the model. And in a, um, they can be released in a random fashion or according to some blend. Um, if, if the, in this instance, if we were looking at um, when the products were flowing through the weld table, um, each time a new product came through, maybe a changeover. Um, would occur. So our tool setup that often would exist. And obviously when we have what we're looking at on the screen right now, there's quite a few different uh, changeovers that would be occurring. They would only not occur when we have a slug of consecutive vehicles of the same type. But in this instance, we would probably have something that would be causing a bottleneck or a constraint due to the number of changeovers and tool setups that would exist. So if we introduce what this model, uh, this, this small model is showing, a flexible tool that had a rotating weld face, um, what we're looking at here at this particular, um, this, this machine right here, it actually has four faces on it, you know, one for each vehicle type. And so instead of doing a changeover, the actual table rotates. So when a particular, if it's a product type one, the table is going to rotate in X amount of seconds. In this case, it might be 15 seconds to rotate the table. And then the uh, vehicle will, the vehicle's part will go onto that table, get welded, and then rotate around and exit off. And there's, there's uh, tables that even exist where the product could be being uh, worked on while the, the, the next one's getting loaded on. So this is just an example of a, how we can simulate um, a flexible tool. And I've seen even from experience um, how engineers that have actually had this task of, of in, introducing the rotating weld face and in the meetings um, they were actually had designed their own little iconic uh, model. So they had a just a layout, uh, an actual layout of the facility, let's say an AutoCAD layout of the facility and sticky notes, uh, and then on the whiteboard or chalkboard, they are writing the cycle times. 
and see and, and doing the, the a deterministic calculation of a run through uh, scenario and, and discussing you know is it going to meet cycle time we ultimately took that um, and put it into the uh, a, a simulation and were able to go uh, much further but it start it all started when they were uh, actually uh, trying to uh, gain ans answers to whether or not it's going to meet cycle time and they were doing it uh, in a fashion that uh, you know everyone could understand um, at the board, but they could only run through obviously limited scenarios. When we take it into the simulation world, we could run uh, uh, a whole gamut of what ifs on it. So we're able to to go much further there than the, the initial team could do with their. I, but uh, it was a valiant effort um, doing a simulation and uh, just with an iconic model of it with using sticky notes. Um, another example of routing um, is the flexibility. Um, so, flexibility in routing, I should say. So, in this example, we can see um, instead of having just one well table with uh, changeovers and tool setups, uh, does it warrant having four um, well tables, one in each, one for each unique product type? But when we do that, we know that uh, when we start putting uh, parallel machines into it, it, it's an opportunity for the sequence to get uh, out of sequence or late vehicles and so on. Do we release one when one has a longer cycle time? Do we ma maintain the cycle time? Um, then there could be a combination of the two as, as well. Um, there could be question management might ask, well, can we just get away with two or three machines and have, you know, on our low runners and actually still do a little set up adjust tool setup adjustment and still make cycle time. So it can be a combination of the two. It doesn't have to warrant um, having a dedicated asset. You might be able to uh, we might be able to prove this out and show that uh, we can still meet the target um, using uh, three machines. Um, simple example of showing how we can run product, mixed product through uh, routing decisions and um, looking at our uh, our throughput, whether or not we're going to make, uh, meet the, the uh, target value. So our next topic really was looking at uh, the complexity that it arises when we do look at uh, introducing a uh, family of products through a facility. This example is, again, it's just a simple palletized loop. So we have five lines. We have five lines uh, with decouplers or buffers in between them. A cross transfer looks like a parallel cross transfer heading into line four and five, and then the vehicles uh, travel. Uh, they ultimately will go up to a uh, shipping or to their next facility, and then an empty pallet returns um, through the, the empty pallet uh, return. And then we also do have a marketplace. So some of these uh, um, have some of the lines four and five have the sub component that are going to be delivered. Um, in this case, it looks like it's being delivered by an AGV uh, vehicle, so automated guided vehicle is delivering these two, um, these two assemblies. But the uh, objective of this particular model is just looking at different scheduling methods. So what we have at hand is uh, the market demand has this schedule. So we would like to produce 41.5% of vehicle type 1. We would like to produce, the market demand would say we want 22% of vehicle 2, 14.5 of vehicle 3, 13.5 of vehicle 4, and we have a low runner of 8.5% of vehicle 5. And management might say, well, what's the best way to build these? Um, and, and, and also we know this, it's, it's given that these are the, the cycle times, the, the design cycle times, they're, they're capable Vehicle one, we know that we can produce at 41.1 jobs per hour. A vehicle two, we can do 40 41.0. Uh, vehicle three takes the least amount of time, 50.3. So we can make 50.3 uh, if we were just making vehicle type threes. We have a low runner, that this one that's only 8.5%. It's, it's uh, has the longest cycle time it takes. It, so it only can produce 31.4 per hour. We know that when we run those. So if we had, if we were doing it just by customer demand, that might be like, what if it was just a random uh, distribution of these? Just random. We know that there these take rates or this product mix, but just uh, release the vehicles in a random fashion, or do it according to some 
a blend or a sequential string of vehicles. When I say that, you might release four uh, vehicle type ones followed by 2.2 vehicle type twos followed by 1.4 vehicle uh, types. Well, how do you do 1.4? Well, sometimes you're going to release one, sometimes you're going to release two. But on average, when you look at a string of vehicles, it should fit within these percents. So when we um, look at that uh, within the simulation, we can run all these through. So we, in that model, we created a dialog box. This dialog box gives us the opportunity to set them either to, to release the vehicles according to a random mix or according to some sequential string or we can do it to a, a, sequential, or a sequential string um, with um, at some batch size associated with this low runner. So we're expecting this low runner um, that has the, this actually has uh, broke our rule of thumb, this actually has more than 30 percent difference in the cycle time. So this will definitely has could cause some uh, problems because it has such a slow, a different cycle time than the rest that are up in the 40s and, and one being in the 50 uh, jobs per hour or vehicles per hour. So um, when we look at the results that took place when we ran this model, we were able to, in a random fashion, if we just released them according to a random uh, draw of, those, of that product mix, we were able to obtain 38.2 jobs per hour. When we actually put it into a blend or a string trying to uh, release them in some known fashion, we only got an incremental improvement of 0.2 jobs per hour, per hour. So more than likely that low runner is causing uh, the, an issue. So if we did, if we do a um, the same string or blend, but we put uh, a batch size of that of that vehicle five, which was the one that had the 31 point jobs per hour capability, we see that we do get a significant gain up to 39.9 jobs per hour. And then if we take it even further and we look at that this, we know that this one was the best of actually doing a blend of vehicles with the low runner um, at, um, at a batch, sending five of those out. We could say, what if we did a batch size of five? What if we did a batch size of 10, 15, all the way up to 40? So when we do that, we can see that a batch size of 15 produced 40.7 jobs per hour. So we're getting a two and a half per for a two and a half jobs per hour gain, that's huge in the automotive uh, world. A anything that's uh, even a half a jobs per hour is big, is associated with big money. So a two and a half uh, jobs per hour increase is huge. If you start uh, getting the batch size of that low runner uh, up near, you know, 40, 20, 30, 40 jobs, you're going to distort the mix. You're going to start getting a little bit too far away from the, the customer order base. So we want to, um, so it looks like, you know, a batch size of 15 keeps it uh, well, um, and that's more than likely where management would uh, decide to um, run it according to a blend with uh, a batch size of 15 units associated with it. So you can see that um, simulation can be applied through when we're starting very early on in the uh, engineering where product engineers are, just, are working with manufacturing engineers. Um, we start to see um, putting together, are there going to be process changes to the, the existing facility? So we have to do some line balancing and setting up stations and tack times. We're introducing new technology and flexible tools into the system. Um, we have to adjust our schedule, schedule and always trying to uh, minimize our tool setups and our changeovers. And so we can uh, ultimately we're going to get to a point where we can run this, this entire facility in the simulation uh, world, conduct, can conduct what if analysis, um, improve out our throughput to make sure that we're meeting our targets, to make sure that our scheduling our algorithms are working correctly to make sure that any of our flexible tools uh, are not causing uh, bottlenecks or constraints or in making sure that we reduce the risk um, associated with them so they're not sensitive to changes in the product mix. So these are all things that can be um, analyzed 
and conducted prior to implementation um, where any of these costs or any of these uh, changes at uh, when, at, when we get close to implementation would be costly. So when we, when we look at uh, trying to get multiple vehicles into a facility, sure there's quite a few conflicting uh, objectives. We're trying to cut costs, we're reducing time, we're ultimately trying to improve um, the quality. Sure, this, this sounds you know, um, great to manage, but, but how is it even possible? So most of these things can be uh, answered and proved out through the simulation. So the benefits, um, obviously, when we uh, uh, have a facility up and running and tested and working well, it's going to reduce our inventory levels. We have shorter lead times, um, improve our efficiency. It's going to improve our productivity and improve resource utilization. Um, some of the disadvantages um, are basically it, it does increase our complexity. The, the logistics and material flow become a little bit more complicated. We do need to put some thought behind it on uh, where uh, part where, where uh, signaling, you know, signaling of, of uh, subcomponents to build that particular uh, component to make sure that that rendezvous is going to occur. Um, since we're, we're uh, reducing inventory levels, we're trying to get the right uh, component at the right time, at the right place, um, with the uh, a limited amount of rack or line side uh, storage that exists. So that definitely is going to require some uh, early planning. That's where simulation comes into it. Uh, generally, there's initial higher costs associated um, when we're implementing or when we're designing uh, these uh, flexible systems. And we have to train our operator skill level to not only just be uh, uh, skilled at one particular job, but they might be uh, required uh, to handle a handful of jobs, uh, particularly the jobs that are associated or adjacent to them. And um, when we looked at these facilities, um, it's a disadvantage and, a, and, a, and I guess an advantage of, of working multiple shifts. Um, you were going to, often these plants are working around the clock, 24-7, uh, maybe three shift patterns. So that obviously reduces your time for uh, impro or your uh, maintenance schedule. So when we're working around the clock, we, we're gonna, we always have to have maintenance. So we might have to do that on the weekends, or we might have to set some time aside on particular times to conduct uh, maintenance within our normal production schedule. So these are all factors that uh, come into play. So simulation definitely reduces the risk um, when we're implementing the uh, manufacturing facilities that are striving to do multiple uh, product variants, particularly when it comes to co uh, cost, quality, and time. 